It's not safe to go swimming in a long denim skirt. It's not safe to walk in a long denim (laughs) skirt. (laughs) True. But I also feel as well that this obsession with all the healthy, you know, snail and kale and (laughs) all that stuff is a luxury. Like if you can obsess over that stuff, it's definitely a luxury. There's, um, you know, I'm not going to get a statistic, but. Whether they go to a public school, a Christian school, a Mennonite school, or a homeschooled, it's still my job to teach them what to do when they come in contact with people that, you know, want to show them something bad on their phone or want to tell them a dirty joke or whatever. Like, yes, of course, it's something I worry about but I think you should worry about it too. It, it really has that air air of fear, like do this or you're gonna look haggard. Do this or your skin's gonna break down. Also like recognizing what is core doctrinal salvational issues and what is just personal preference or choices and not getting them mixed up. Goodness, we are the stars of the show, the sparkle <laughs> of the night, my goodness. <laughs> Love it. We are in celebratory mode. And kind of morning mode, too. We can't believe it. It's the end of an era. Season four is coming to a wrap. I can't believe we've been doing it for so long. But instead of feeling sad, I want to, like, celebrate it because, I mean, we successfully moved to our own channel. Yes. You guys are still here. Thank you for being here. Share with a friend. And yes, this is the last episode of the season. We're going to take a break for a month before we come back again, Lord willing. Um, but yeah, go ahead and watch all the ones that you missed from before. Share with a friend. Um follow, subscribe, all the things. We really appreciate it. And we forget to say that a lot of the time, but yeah, it does. It shows up in your feed then. You won't miss when we have one out. And if you ever are like, where is Honey, I'm Homemaker at? Remember we post every other Monday. Maybe YouTube's just being sneaky and not showing you our videos. So yeah. So anyway, today's going to be the end of season Q&A. We want to get right into it. So before we do that, let's do our Homemaker Hot Take. take. My homemaker hot take is that baking by weights or grams is easier than using a measuring cup. And that blows my mind. I cannot believe I'm saying that. But I started doing sourdough and a lot of the recipes are grams. I'm like, oh, this is so annoying. I started doing it. I'm like, this is easier. Yeah, you only need one bowl, right? I only need one bowl. I don't have to count my cups. I don't have to count the teaspoons. I just do it till the number's close, right? Whatever. Go into the next thing. Zero it out. It's so much easier. So could I bake chocolate chip cookies that way? If you can find a recipe that's written or you know how to convert it. Why aren't we doing that more? I don't know. I don't know. I it's, should, it's, I should. it's better. It's more accurate. It's easier. It's less dishes. You wouldn't want to do it with cookies though because I use my KitchenAid mixer. But yes, anything you can, in a bowl. You can set your your mixing bowl on the scale. Yeah, but it, then I have to keep taking it off the KitchenAid. Oh, to mix the things. Yeah, I'm just saying like for yeah, that yeah. I wouldn't want to. But anything with your hand that you're stirring yeah. or, oh my goodness, Yeah. So maybe if you have a favorite recipe that's annoying and you do have a kitchen scales, maybe convert it and it would be worth the time to do the math and figure it out. Yeah, and like I think it's easier for kids to help too because you can visualize the amount, you know, you just put little by little until it hits the right number. But if you go over, there's not going back always. That is true. That is true. Yeah, it's not always. I mean, I, I have scooped that right. things you out. You can't hardly get salt back out of flour or whatever. You have right. to be more strategic you have to go about the slow order. A little bit at a time. Yeah. yeah. Oh my goodness. Well, my homemaker hot take is: it's not always the fastest and easiest and smartest thing to do to send your husband for something that you need last minute. Twenty twenty three was the year of crappy toilet paper. No pun intended. <laughs> I sent Josh to the store, or he was at. Sam's Club, I think it was. And he's like, we're out of toilet paper, aren't we? I'm like, yeah, soon. He gets like a 64-pack roll of toilet paper, brings it home, and he's the one that's always like, wants the bougie toilet paper. I'm like, it's toilet paper. It's all the same thing. Yeah, Uh, well, mm -hmm. I've learned differently (laughs) since then. He comes home with his toilet paper, and we've been using it for an entire year. I kid you not, there's still like three or four rolls left. 2024 is looking brighter as these (laughs) dwindle down, but they're like some two-ply, I don't know. We need to buy a camper just to use up these toilet paper rolls. I'm so (laughs) sick of them. (laughs) Maybe you could donate them to the cabin the next time you go or something. Yeah, so either be super specific or just do it yourself. (laughs) If you want something done right, you know Um, what they say. Yeah, so I think for our Q&A today, we'll just go back and forth and ask each other questions, and we can either both weigh in or one of us, whatever. We don't like to talk when we don't have nothing to say, so if there's something, if one of us answers a question and the other one doesn't, maybe it's just we weren't feeling inspired on that question. Right. So go ahead, Jaina, hit us with the first one. Okay. Someone asks, can hair be worn down if still covered? Oh, we were doing a Mennonite question first. Uh, I mean, that's the first one I wrote down. We don't have to start with that one. Yeah. Are we Mennonites to you first or homemakers or just chatty blabby girls? Like, what? Yeah. yeah. Interesting. How do they think of us? 
I don't know. We did get quite a few questions pertaining to Mennonites. So. Okay, we'll scatter them throughout. <laughs> yeah, I just picked it. Um, first of all, if I wanted to, I could shave my hair and dye it blue. If I wanted to. Dye what blue? Your scalp? <laughs> no, that was, it was a joke. You got it. Good job. Um, I don't want to do that, obviously. I choose to go to a church that I really love, and the church asks me to wear my hair pinned up and covered. So, no, if I wanted to go to the church that I currently attend... I can't wear a long braid down my back or my hair loose and flowing and just put a veiling on top. I'm not saying you can't or that's wrong. You can do whatever you want, but that is the specific regulations for the church that I attend. I thought it'd be fun to answer. Someone asked, what's one of your favorite memories with your mom? So I'll share in case anything comes to your mind while I'm sharing. I had to laugh. My mom, she is the farmer of our family. My dad has a different job, but I grew up on a farm and she was the veal calf lady and that she, yeah, anyway, she loved working outside or she did it a lot. I assumed she liked it. <laughs> she at least, I didn't hear her complaining about it a lot when I was a kid. But anyway, she, my mom always tried to convince at least one of her kids to go along with her to the grocery store. She hated grocery shopping by herself. And I kind of get it now. Like, I, I do enjoy shopping by myself. But I have little kids. I think once you have like a 12-year-old, they're actually somewhat helpful. Anyway, she she'd always twist her arm to who wants to go along for groceries because she didn't want to go by herself. And one Christmas... I thought of this because we just came through Christmas. One Christmas, um, we needed our groceries. And Walmart is nuts at Christmas time. But she needed food items and a few other things too. And Walmart's the place to go when you need to get things in different genres, you know. And she's like, we are going to get up in the middle of the night and we're going to go for groceries. This is back when Walmart was open 24-7. Or at least our Walmart is not open 24-7 anymore. And so we got up at 3 in the morning to go for grocery. We went through the grocery aisles at 3 in the morning at Walmart why again <laughs> this is one of my favorite memories okay <laughs> to beat all the crowds because it was christmas it was oh, like okay, the week okay. of christmas it was mm-hmm. it's a madhouse trust me it is a madhouse i was yeah. just there the other week when at christmas time it was nuts anyway and we got home by five o'clock so that she could go out it was probably actually four thirty, so that she could go out to the veal barn and feed the cat calves and dad could go to work um and i went back to bed again but yeah got up at three we were just like giggling together like oh my word this is so ridiculous and what an adventure and how silly and whatever i don't know it's just a fun memory that i have with my mom um i don't think anybody else was along i can't remember that there was um but yeah that's just a memory that came to my mind hmm well, you answered for your mother. I, I think the person asked about your father, too. Oh. So I'll just one. share. My favorite memories with my dad will be on our boat and him teaching us to ski. Um, I would say he was pretty patient. And to this day, like, I don't even bother trying to ski if my dad's not driving the boat because he knows, like, exactly how to do it that I can get up. But he was just determined that his daughter was going to learn to ski at a very young age. And I did. But we worked at it for a couple summers before I mastered the skill and just some of the best memories out in the sunshine on the boat on the lake so love it Mm -hmm. oh nostalgia (laughs) yes I guess since we just talked about boating we'll transition right into this one which is another Mennonite question why are Mennonites okay with wearing bathing suits modesty goes out the window wow okay first of all I said a little attitude yeah first of all (laughs) disagree um modesty is relative i think not all things are relative but i do think modesty is you have to be appropriate for the situation and i think when you're swimming the first thing you need to consider is safety it's not safe to go swimming in a long denim skirt it's not safe to walk in a long (laughs) denim skirt (laughs) true or a long flowing cave dress i mean that if that is your modesty standard to go to church or to go to the grocery store that is not safe to be your modesty standard when swimming and when i swim i'm doing you know, diving off the diving board, going off the rope swing, skiing, like I said before, I'm actively swimming. My attire needs to be form-fitting, right, to maintain a safe. And also, if you're wearing a fabric that's not designed to be worn when wet, that can be more immodest because it's clinging to every curve. You can see straight through it. That's not modest, okay? So swimwear, by definition, is not immodest, okay? And you can find all varying degrees of coverage when it comes to that. Yeah. So the things that I think about are, is it safe? Am I going to be able to move and to swim? It's not going to get tangled on anything. And grab your child as they're running towards the deep end. It's a safety issue. Even if you're just, your kids are swimming and you're sitting, you're not even swimming. You know, consider what you're wearing. Are you going to be able to jump in and safely, you know, get your child if needed? Things that I consider to maintain modesty are decent necklines. And there are options out there. 
I do have some linked in my Amazon store under clothing. Some options that I will like mi- mix and match, wear together shorts, swimsuits. We have matching whatever. swimsuits because because it's a Jane, good one. It's I march. I march to the pond, and Gina's like, "Where's your swimsuit from?" <laughs> I send her the link, and she's wearing it the ne- very next week. I'm like, Great. "It was a good one. It's a good one. What can I say?" <laughs> so decent necklines and shorts of a reasonable length. I'm not going to tell you what that length is. You can decide for yourself. But something that also. Um, I've had swimsuits when I like dive that they don't stay put, right? So something that stays put when you're actively swimming, but consider the occasion and the atmosphere. Also who you're swimming with most of the time when I'm swimming, I'm with family, immediate family or women and children. So there again, I might wear something or choose a different swimsuit when we are swimming with a larger, more extended group of people. Yeah. So, and there's lots yeah. of options out there too, when it comes to like, swimwear fabric if you just want to throw a swimwear like athletic shirt over top of something that's right. less modest I actually when we go boating oh my word I'm gonna say it out loud here when we go boating I wear a bikini and then shorts and a shirt on top rather than a tankini that doesn't really cover as much I don't know if you could picture that in your head I, I, when you would see me I'm just look like I'm wearing a, an athletic shirt and then longer shorts yeah that's when I'm with Josh's family and stuff whatever but then I know I have appropriate underwear underneath that are made for getting wet yes. and all of that so there's a lot of different options out there you have to find out what's comfortable for you um and I definitely don't think modesty goes out the window it's just a little more situational and right um if it if you don't want to be around certain people in your swimsuit maybe that's fine like you know if you don't want to be around some random dude or whatever yeah um and then as far as like when I go to the beach, I am around random people. I feel fine going to the beach. But I feel like I'm very modest in relativity to everybody else around me. Right. Um, but, you know, God can always work on your heart and change things too. So maybe this person is going to be praying for us that we change our modesty standards. You but know, yeah. for me and for my husband, it's a joint decision together. And this whole modesty discussion just really <laughs> gets me heated. We've never done a podcast dedicated to this. No. But I have sons, right? I want to teach my sons to treat women with respect. All women, no matter what they are wearing or aren't wearing. Okay? I don't want to shelter them so much that they don't know how to even, like, interact with a woman that's not dressed like I am. Or not dressed like a conservative Mennonite. Because it will happen. It will happen. To me, it is so important to teach my children, my boys, to be... To be able to respect women because I want them to be a witness and a light to Je- for Jesus no matter where they are, no matter who they come in contact with. You know, if they go to the tribes of Africa and women are topless, I feel like any Christian man should be able to preach Jesus to her and be respectful and treat her like a human, not a with piece a of meat. But right, yeah, but exactly. modesty it is... is- I just get so tired of being preached at about modesty when I really think we just need to be treating people with respect and treat your own body with respect. I'm not saying don't be modest. I'm just saying there is much more at stake. Yeah. But yeah, if you run into me on the beach in Florida and you want to say hi and you're like, maybe I shouldn't because she's not standing there in her skirt or whatever. Like you can say hi. It's fine. Like I'm swimming, whatever. (laughs) I don't know. Um, But yeah. Good, good question. I mean, yeah, it's good fun discussion. Question. Yeah. I would love to hear what other people think yeah. because I know we all have different um, standards for ourselves and that's great. Do you think it is important to be married for a couple years before having kids? I saw that one. Yeah, I think for myself, um, I think it's optimal. I mean, I, I enjoyed the years we had, but now I we also waited four years. Because I was teaching school and I loved it and I felt fulfilled and I just didn't have the mothering instinct in me or I didn't think I had the mothering instinct in me. Lo and behold, I have children now. I love it. Um, it's, I get to be my own boss and I, all of that. I just love it so much having my children. It's just nothing like it. Like life only really started once I started having kids, mm-hmm. I feel. I hate to say that because I know that some of you who are listening would love to have children. It's just not happening. Um, but yes, if you have the choice – And want to have children, I highly recommend having children. And I don't necessarily think having them right off the bat is necessarily what I would choose for myself. But at the same time, you got to be realizing that, you know, you're married. You're doing married things. You could have a child. So, um, yeah, be open to it, I feel like, at all times. But if I was going to give you advice, I would say, you know, settle into your wifehood is a word and um figuring out for me there was a lot to learn with running a home and all that too um but yeah sometimes things happen so (laughs) yeah I don't have much to add to that I would just say I don't think it's important but I don't regret 
the years that we had before children came along. I have very fond memories of those times. It was a time of growing and learning. But yeah, it's not something that I feel like you should say, you must wait a certain amount of years. Yeah, Everyone's and definitely different. take into account your age as well. Some people get married at different ages yeah. and kind of reverse plan a little bit because it's not always it's not going to always be a possibility for you to have children. Right. Um, my next question kind of goes along with that. Someone asked, how do you know when your family is complete? To that I say, your family is complete. As it is. <laughs> if more children are added, then that is complete. The family you have right now is complete. If you have no children and you're just a husband and wife, that is a whole complete family just as it is. But if you're asking how do you know when or if to add more children, I don't know. Yeah. Know. Um, I've asked someone or many people older and wiser than me. And you know what? They won't tell me the answer either. So yeah, I've got I no mean, answer for you. <laughs> I think you're a real good, great person in asking that question because I would love to ask it too if somebody knows the answer. But yeah. when you know, you know, some people say, but I'm like, no, it's not true. No. <laughs> what is your dream vacation with or without kids? <sighs> I feel like I've had my dream vacation. Oh, yeah. Actually, um, like, let's dream realistically, like something that could actually happen. Um, I mean, I guess anything could actually happen, but I just don't see in the near future Josh and I flying off to Bora Bora or anything like that. Um, I think a dream vacation for me would be, hmm, how about this? I take my parents along so I can have the kids some of the time and they can babysit them the rest of the time. But me and Josh can still get away. A nanny. Oh my goodness. There we go. Actually, I would love to do this sometime. I feel like I owe my parents the world. Take them along, pay for their trip. They can come along, but also be like, okay, here's the schedule this night and this night. Can you watch the kids and put them to bed early while we go do this or that? But now where would we go? That's my question. I have a list of like places in the U.S. that I would like to go with children, um, like Colorado, Utah is like at the top of the list. It looks so pretty. We were in Arizona. That was a dream vacation. That's why I feel like I've already lived my dream. Mm-hmm. That was with just Josh though. So I don't know, but it is fun to like think about. Is there any traveling in your future? Yes. I don't even think I've told you this, but we are planning to go to Colorado and we're going to take the kids that along. That was on my list. Yeah, That's I know. Awesome. I thought of it when you said it. Um, we Eric has a business meeting out there and we decided we haven't booked anything yet. And I have no idea how to go about planning a trip like that. But we want to go to like Canyon City and um, Colorado Springs and do certain attractions there. Like I would love to go to a hot springs. The boys would love to see a gold mine. Oh, so maybe something that sounds like, just like that. Yeah, I, I know. It. Right. And I think we would... We would like to go to the focus on the family, like Wits End, that's in Colorado Springs. My dad was telling me some places, so I just need to sit down and like book all the things. Is this the spring? It would be in June. Okay, after so then, school. Yeah, then the meeting, um, we would do, visit, do all the touristy things, and then um, Eric would have his meetings, and me and the kids would just chill at the hotel. Hopefully there would be a pool. So very much looking forward to that. But I think the ultimate vacation that I've had so far in my life, probably besides my honeymoon, although it's up for debate, is our couple's trip to Jamaica. That was just so much fun. Now, I will say the worst part about an adults-only vacation is leaving your children. That's also the best part, but it's the worst part. I cried on the way to the airport. I wrote a death note to my children on the way to the airport. I was like such a You were so morbid. I know. I was like, well, what if they die? I was like, they're never going to remember me. They're so young. And I was like writing up like... This was two years ago we went. You just can't think that hard. Yeah, but yeah, I know. It's... But after I got there and yes. saw you guys, I was like, okay, time to party. We're paying for this anyway. Yeah. So you're going to enjoy it. Oh, I loved it so much. Yeah, I love your idea dream. of going on a trip, bringing the kids, but then have the option to also like have some solo time too. So yeah, it's just yeah. easier said than done. What's your next question? How do you balance time with your family and your husband's family? Honestly, this isn't something I really think about. If we get an invitation, we accept it. Whichever event is scheduled first stands around the holidays. There's a bit more juggling and trying to keep things fair. But in general, like families are different. We spend more time with my family. We spend time with Eric's family as much as the opportunity arises. And I don't really feel the need to necessarily keep it fair or to think too much about it. Yeah, I I think that question comes into play if you have petty mother-in-law, mother's you know, those two, like, kind of back and forth, like, so-and-so always gets to see the grandkids, and I don't, or, like, whatever. I don't ever get that from either of them, so it's not a problem at all, which I know I'm very blessed. (laughs) Yeah. It's nothing I did. It's it's not 50-50, and it doesn't have to be, I don't think. Yeah. It shouldn't have to be. How does Jesus look at the obsession of health food these days? Ooh, I have that one down, too. I definitely think Jesus actually has an opinion on this. Mm -hmm. You have a Bible verse? Yeah. A Bible verse? 
Um, Matthew 6 25 says, therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on is not the life more than meat and the body more than raiment. And I really encourage you to read the full chapter because there's so much good stuff in here. And at the end, it says, seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. So it doesn't say you don't need food. You don't need clothes. You do need them. And the Lord knows that. And if you're seeking him, those things will fall into place. Um, and then, so contrast that verse with 1 Corinthians 6, 19, 20, which says your body is a temple and honor God with your body. So I think if you take those two portions of scripture in that we see moderation. Okay. So your body is a temple. We should be thinking about what we put into our body, but our bodies are not the most important thing. Life is the most important thing. Our souls are yeah. Our children's souls are the most important thing. So that's that's what I think. I would like to do a whole podcast about beauty and beauty standards and just the way we view the importance of that. And this kind of plays into this as well where I feel like a lot of times the obsession with all the healthy foods and stuff comes down purely to aesthetics and this, the terrified feeling of aging and all of that. And I feel like oftentimes when I watch YouTubers or I'm seeing Instagram stuff, um, it, it really has that air air of fear like do this or you're gonna look haggard do this or your skin's gonna break down eat this or you know and I feel like it's all kind of as one and um, I do think we do need to acknowledge that the world we live in now is not like the food is not the same it's food like substances sometimes Mm -hmm. but I also feel as well that this obsession with all the healthy you know snail and kale and (laughs) all that stuff is a luxury like if you can obsess over that stuff it's definitely a luxury there's um you know I'm not going to get a statistic, but I'm sure over half the world is just happy to fill their bellies every evening. And so I definitely think it can be a God. It can be an obsession. Yeah, We're all going to die. Yeah. So there's no avoiding it, no matter how healthy you eat. And I think when your children come into play, it also makes it harder. You can really mom guilt yourself into things. Um, But I just try to say I do my best. And then we take our vitamins. We get lots of rest and sunshine Mm -hmm. and um, all of that. And we... The rest is, I mean, you can't control it. No, you can't. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I think it's definitely turned into somewhat of a God and also something that people can control. Like it's something you can control what you put into your body and other things that you can't. So um, if you enjoy healthy food and like watching out for like the seed oils and all that stuff, I think you're doing a good thing. Yeah, for sure. Definitely. But at the cost of what? Just make sure you have margin yeah. in your life to do that. How have you grown in the past year? I thought this was a really good question and it caused me to reflect back to over the year And what came to my mind, and maybe if I thought longer about this, I would change my answer, but with a little bit of thought, I think I've become more content with my home, the way it looks, my kitchen, whatever, with my family, and also just being okay with the unknown, not having to have a plan and just taking life as it comes, day by day, week by week, month by month, and just being okay with not having a plan. That's all I'm going to say about that. Well, I've definitely grown in body (laughs) over the last year. Um, Something that came to my mind was our marriage. I feel like we've grown and we've grown in our communication and just learning how to like oftentimes we just argue or say our opinions, you know, and not discuss things like we're just having a discussion here. Like just the other night we were driving home from Josh's parents and we were talking about a church topic and I would just like acknowledge this is like a fun discussion. I'm going to play devil's advocate here or whatever. And, you know, instead of just like attacking and then we both realized, oh, we're neither of us really care that much. I don't know. Just like communication in general. I feel like we've learned a lot of different things throughout the year. Um, Yeah, that's just one thing that came to my mind. I'm sure I'll think of something better after the cameras turned Mm -hmm. off. (laughs) What do you do to feel close to your husband after a period of less attraction? Maybe I asked this one because I totally identify with it with just like fluctuating hormones as women and stuff. I feel like sometimes our drives are way higher than others. And sometimes I would really feel guilty, um, especially like right at the beginning when I was pregnant. I just was like not, a, like she used the word attraction. Like I just didn't have that much. I didn't think about that area of my life very much. And one thing that came to my mind was I'm never more attracted to my husband than when I'm watching him do something that he's good at and other people are admiring him doing mm-hmm. that. And it's like, oh my word, that's my man. Um, Like just watching him, you know, measure a window for somebody and talk to him about the options or I don't know. So if you can like go to his work and see what he's doing, something like that, I feel like that can breed um, just more of respect, admiration and, you know. Yeah. I don't know. Is anything came to your mind? Well, I completely agree with that. And 
talking positively about your husband at Christmas. I was telling some people how Eric just has this skill in his work to like take people and identify their talents and to put them in a position where they can really thrive. And it just made me, like saying it out loud just made me like, you know, he is, he is a really good guy. And you know, like that attraction grows when it, maybe if you don't feel it, but just like to verbalize it out loud to someone else, it makes you realize that um, you are attracted to him. <laughs> I'm not saying it wasn't yeah. before, but anyway, you know what I'm saying. Oh man. And then the next question someone asked, do you have friends outside the Mennonite community? Yes, I have a few that I would consider close friends and also a few family members who are no longer part of the Mennonite community. Not a ton, but yes, some that we would interact with fairly regularly. I don't have, none of my closest, closest friends are not Mennonite. They're all Mennonite, all of them. Does that make sense? All my closest friends, like my closest, okay, closest yeah. friends closest are friends. Mennonite yeah. um, currently. Um, and I appreciate that. I really like that, you know, we're kind of going through the same things in life and kind of coming from the same backgrounds and stuff. But that's something that I hate about Lancaster County. I feel like you can really quickly be in an echo chamber if you're not careful. And so something I did there for a while was I would went to a mom's group that did not have, I mean, they had Mennonites there, but it was a lot of non-Mennonites as well. And I really appreciated it for what it was and just like getting to know people outside of my smaller Mennonite circles and stuff. But yeah, it's something that I would love to grow with and have friends from different um, places and walks of life. Our neighbor lady just dropped off some baklava and she's from Egypt and she's invited me over for Turkish coffee. And so I want to be intentional to take her up on that. Like I do want to um, widen my circle a little bit. I don't want to be in an echo chamber. And especially since I lived in Lancaster County my entire life, Mm -hmm. I didn't even travel and live in different areas. And I just don't want to be narrow minded. But I will say YouTube has so helped with that. When people ask me questions or opinions about things, I definitely can say I don't look at it just through my tiny, narrow little lens. I think about the situations of my online friends and stuff too and how this question might very well affect their life you know like Mm -hmm. questions about divorce and remarriage and you know evil mother-in-laws and stuff like Mm -hmm. that you know there's people out there that are dealing with all of those things so yeah it's definitely something I want to grow in though I'm not going to sit here and say that I have a very very diverse group of friends yeah the next question is do you ever have to worry other Mennonite kids are exposing your kids to bad subjects and I think this one question said at school in particular I worry about it (laughs) okay so here's my thing First of all, there are non-Mennonites at our school too. So it's not all Mennonite kids. And I'm happy about that. That's one of the reasons I love our school is because it's people from a diverse variety of backgrounds. And I think that's great. But yes, kids of all denominations are capable of bad behavior. Mine included. So yes, I do worry about it for sure. But it's my job to teach my children how to behave, how to speak, how to treat other people so that they're neither the bad influence or negatively influenced. Yeah, they're going to come in contact with people that don't think or act the way that I would want them to act. But it's my job to teach my children how to act so that they're not influenced by that. Whether they go to a public school, a Christian school, a Mennonite school, or a homeschooled, it's still my job to teach them what to do when they come in contact with people that, you know, want to show them something bad on their phone or want to tell them a dirty joke or whatever. Like, yes, of course, it's something I worry about. But I think you should worry about it too. I think everyone should. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. I think also a precursor to this whole thing is to have a relationship with your children that they can come to you if somebody says something weird or like, Mm -hmm. what does this word mean? Or like, and they can feel comfortable enough to do that. And so that's something I've been doing with my daughter, which I know not everybody can do this, um, but it's an idea. Maybe this will work into your life is I try to do something with her because she is in school a large part portion of the week. I try to do something fun with her on Saturdays and we're usually driving somewhere to go do that fun thing. And when we're in the car, I try to very intentionally like ask her about her week and blah, blah, blah. Did anybody say anything this week that made you uncomfortable? Do you have any questions about something that you heard? Um, what did we talk about? I always say, what did we talk about last time? Because it's really hard to bring up like body things or birds and bees stuff like just naturally so if I say what did we talk about last time she often remembers and like right now the big discussion is where babies come from and like how they come out and like different things like that and so I'll always make sure I say now you know this is a conversation that I want to tell you about you don't go tell your friends and things like that and so in the midst of those discussions I'll be like did you know did anybody tell you anything that you want to ask me about stuff like that and sometimes she actually has stuff um, Mm -hmm. rarely but I think that's being proactive and yeah. like acting like there is something that's going to be coming up because there probably is. Yeah, for sure. You know, two tips that I would have is 
Now, I know this isn't possible for every school situation, but this is one reason why I really love to go in and volunteer every week because I want to know the kids at least bare minimum to put a name to a face so that then when they do tell me about a situation, like I'll know who the kid is. And if you just kind of know the kids, it's like, yeah, I, I don't think he meant it like that or be like, okay, yeah, well, I know, you know, maybe their family's going through something or just kind of knowing who the people are at school. It just helps me to like navigate some situations and there really hasn't been any yet, but I am like looking, I'm sure there will be at some point, you know, we always have to expect that those things are going to happen because kids are kids, humans are humans. Also, we play this game. It's not really a game, but we call it what made you feel and the boys love it. It's like a little question game. I think I talked about it before, but I'll ask them what made you feel happy today? What what made you feel sad today? What made you feel discouraged or proud or strong or brave or whatever? And it's just a way to get them talking. Um, and then sometimes they ask me questions, but just a way to like open up the door that if there is something bothering them, hopefully giving them an opportunity to say it. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I think instilling confidence in your kids, which we could do a whole podcast on that mm-hmm. one as well. Confident to be just different or to say no or yeah, that kind of thing is really important as well. Mm-hmm. Do you see yourself working outside the home when your kids are older? Um, yes. I plan to work outside the home during school hours as early as next year. So I don't have anything lined up, but that is the goal. So yes, I do see myself working outside the home. I don't know because I work from home now and I love it. We'll see. Am I going to be YouTubing when I'm like full of wrinkles and gray hair? I don't know. Who knows? I would love to say I I am because I enjoy it a lot. Um, I do know though that I want to have time if I have grandkids. It sounds so fun to have grandkids. If I have grandkids, I want to have time for them. So I'm going to have to weigh the pros and cons. And I know myself. I know my weaknesses. I know that I will fill up my time too full and be busy again. Like Mm -hmm. So I have to like pump the brakes a little bit. And I want to definitely consider... Like, I want to be there for my married daughter and my married sons and daughters-in-law someday, too. So that's just something I'm going to keep in mind. But yes, I see myself going back into school again, maybe, or, you know, even helping with a business or something, or, you know, working from home, too. But I definitely hope I'm someday when I'm, like, 70, I still have a robust social life. Yes. And I don't know, yeah. my grandma still makes money and works, you know, and she's 70. Okay. There's two questions that kind of go together. I'm going to read them both. Um, The one was, any advice for navigating family members discarding plain dress and covering? And then the next one is, what if a family member is living an ungodly or immoral lifestyle? They had a specific immoral lifestyle. We're not even going to go there. We'll just keep it more broad. Um, So the first one, if it's just an issue of like dress and head covering, just like mind your own business, I guess. Like teach your children why you do the things that you do. And if they have questions about this other family member, just be like, that's the choices they've made for their family. If it's not like a moral or sin issue, just you do you and don't be judgmental about their choices. And I think you need to be very careful before saying things like Christians don't wear pants or Christians always wear a head covering. Um, Yes, but also as well, um, if it's your sister or somebody close to you, you also are an accountability person to them as well. And sometimes the peripherals, peripherals can be you know, the unimportant things or the less important things like your looks and your outward appearance can be signs of something that's happening inside somebody's heart or their trajectory. And so I think it's definitely good to be like, wow, I've noticed you're like, your life's why, why, why did you choose this? Like, why not? If you're close friends or a close family member, I think it's great to have that discussion and let them hear rather than speculating and yeah. just like guessing, um, be blunt and ask them. And I think it's completely fine. And they're going to know right away if you're there to judge them or if you just want to hear, if you want to listen, yeah. if you want to be there for them, if they have anything they want to talk through or discuss. Um, obviously, I think if my daughter someday would just decide to throw away all the Mennonite um, standards and things that I feel are very biblically based, it would be very sad for me. But I think I'd be more concerned about why it's happening. This is very true. And I so, like that. Yeah, yeah, we've had friends that, um, I guess they're technically still Mennonite, but don't like made some changes in their life. And yeah, we had a discussion about it and they explained to us their reasons and you know I heard them we understood what where they were coming from and a lot of it you know I understood why they made the choices they did we didn't like just go around like yeah that's my point like um, it brings up the whole topic of church hurt too. anybody who's part of like a specific religion or like sect of Christianity or something there's sometimes like church hurt and people just want to run far away from whatever that was that they had before mm -hmm. and so they throw the baby out with the bathwater and all of that and yeah, I think motive is very important to consider as well. Yeah, and some of these, some of the families, like maybe they've been like that for a long time, like before your children are even born or whatever. And I just think it's important 
so that they know that people do things differently. Just because someone doesn't look right like you, it doesn't mean that they're doing anything wrong. But I love what you said about hearing their heart and it's okay to ask them, hey, I've noticed you've made changes. Like, why? Can you tell me more about that? Or like, what are you thinking? And maybe they have some really good reasons and maybe they are really hurting and maybe they will never come back to, you know, where they started. But, you know, the important part is that their heart is in the right place. Yeah. Now, I think the- what is scarier is like the next part of the question. Um, like, what if they're rejecting God completely yeah. Or Mm -hmm. they still want to have God, but then completely go against his word at the same time. That is really tricky because you are not God. Right. You shouldn't be playing God, but at the same time, we are called to, you know. Yeah. It's not really a situation that I've dealt with, but I guess, first of all, we should be praying for them um, and talking to them, asking them about, you know, where they are with God. And, and, you know, if they're completely rejecting God, then just pray. Also, I think... I don't know, as long as they can act and speak respectfully and decently around our children, around our family, I don't see a reason like to cut off ties. I think it's still important to maintain a relationship because you might be, like they said, the only Jesus that they see. Um, I don't see a reason to just be like, well, if you don't believe like us anymore, you're no longer welcome in our home. I don't think that's the answer. Treat them with love and kindness and acceptance as long as you can, as long as they're willing to have a relationship with you. I think um, I would want to be open to that. You know, if they're trying to, like, take your children over to the dark side or something, then, yeah, like, that's not appropriate. And, you know, if they're hurt, you know, want to hurt your children or, you know, say bad things to them or whatever, then that's a whole nother story. But if they're willing to act respectfully, then I would be more than happy to continue a relationship. And if they need help, like, where are they going to get it? Probably from their closest friends and family. And so I think it's important to also, like, find out, ask, like, I mean, you can usually tell, but like, do you want to have free, do you want to have a victory over this issue or Mm -hmm. like, how can I help you? Can I be an accountability partner for you? You know, maybe they don't want to be stuck in this sin that they have or whatever. And who better than somebody to come alongside and be a accountability partner or just a friend in a situation where maybe other people are just writing them off, you know? It is really hard though. I, you know, if you have a friend who's dealing with that, pray for that friend too, because that's got to be hard, Mm -hmm. especially when you have emotions involved and feelings and family gatherings. And I pray that I'm never in that kind of a situation. Yeah. And it's easy for me to sit here and to, and say like, do this, don't do that. But like I said, I've never been in that situation and I'm sure it's really hard to know what to do, what to say, what not to say. So many of these questions come down to like that juxtaposition of God's love and mercy and grace and his wrath and judgment and righteousness. Mm -hmm. And then like us as mere little humans trying to walk that path. Yes. And also like recognizing what is core doctrinal salvational issues and what is just personal preference or choices and not getting them mixed up. And I think I don't believe in the whole like deconstructing everything, but also maybe think through everything that you've been taught. And I think when you have children, you do this. Think through what you've been taught and why you've been taught it. And the value of it, if there is value in it or Mm -hmm. not, so that you are prepared for situations like that where it's like, that's different than we always did, but is it wrong? Right. What is your favorite wintertime coffee drink? I love this question. Lately, I have been brewing a shot of espresso, and then my friend gave me chai tea powder. Oh. And so it's like a dirty chai, kind of. I mix it in with a splash of heavy whipping cream, a scant... I'll do one shot of espresso, a scant 100 ml of milk, a splash of heavy whipping cream, and the chai tea powder. And then I'll add some maple syrup and like about a tablespoon, tablespoon and a half. Um, That's my favorite lately. So good. Oh, and I make sure that I whip up the – I make the milk really foamy and put it on the top and sprinkle some cinnamon on the top for prettiness because – it's not a coffee if it doesn't look pretty before you drink it. And I don't know what I'm doing with when it comes to like latte art and stuff. Um, but yeah, that's my favorite one lately. Yeah, I disagree with Megan. The coffee does not have to be pretty. I'm really in a rut. I just do almost always half and half in maple syrup. And that is just the best. Simple and delicious. My friend did give me some chai tea powder and I keep forgetting to use it. So I want to try to remember to do that tomorrow morning and try it out. Because it does sound really yeah, good. Yeah, I use my pretty gold spoon that's really small and I yeah. do two scoops if you need a ratio it sounds really good so I want to try that and I like um earlier this fall I had been putting honey in my coffee honey and cinnamon which is really good too but I always end up going back to 
half and half in maple syrup. No, nothing fancy. I don't even froth the milk. I just brew an Americano and pour it in and it's delicious. So. Oh my goodness. Okay. We have so many more questions here we could talk about, but I just heard Josh walk in with Chick-fil-A. We're going to yes. have a celebratory victory lap meal. Oh, here he is. <laughs> you want to say hi? He is the sound guy and the he helps with some editing and stuff like that. So yeah, this podcast would not be possible without him, but Oh, what a ride it's been. It's been fun. Yeah. We don't usually take too long a break. So hopefully, again, it's just one month and we're back at it again with new topics. Let us know down below what you'd like us to address in the future. Yeah. And we will take them into consideration. Yeah. That's all we'll, we'll promise. We'll it. promise that. Very good. Thanks so much for being here. And we'll see you in the next one. Bye. Bye.